Lo Haumitaki api. Chante washte na pechiza pi. Changlesko ho washte lemye. Hanghi sinte awati. Oglala omaka imataham. Hello, everyone. I'd like to greet you with a warm heart and a good handshake. Uh, I am from Porcupine, South Dakota. My Lakota name is Chungleshko Hawashte, or Good Circle Voice. My English name is Charles Bush, and I am from the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. Uh, today, I will be sharing a land acknowledgement. This the Ramaya Tush Ohlone land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that we are on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaya Tush Ohlone, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. As the indigenous stewards of this land and in accordance with their traditions, the Mayatush Ohlone have never ceded, lost, nor forgotten their responsibilities as the caretakers of this place, as well as for all the peoples who reside in their traditional territory. As guests, we recognize that we benefit from living and working on their traditional homeland. We wish to pay our respects by acknowledging the ancestors, elders, and relatives of the Mayatush community and by affirming their sovereign rights as first people. The Mayatush are the original peoples of the Yalamu, the San Francisco Peninsula. Prior to the arrival of the Spanish in 1769, the Mayatush Olona numbered approximately 1,500 persons and lived in 10 small tribal groups. Today, the four family lineages documented are from one single person, Leandra, who survived the colonization of San Francisco. The Mayatush Olona people are still here today and work to preserve their cultural knowledge, expand the knowledge of their history, revitalize their language, and protect Wara, Mother Earth, and serve the communities in San Francisco. We are honored to work beside them as guests and American Indian relatives on their ancestral homeland. Currently, the Ramayatush are working on the Farming is Medicine initiative in partnership with Deep Medicine Circle to provide fresh produce and traditional medicines to the San Francisco American Indian community and our cultural district from the 34 acre plot of land in San Diego. They have also partnered with the National Park Service to create an online elementary curriculum called Living with the Land. And I just wanted to give a little bit of background about the people from this land. Wopilatanka. Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm Rebecca Johnson. Lauren Esposito. Uh, we are the co-directors of the Summer Systematics Institute, and we are thrilled to welcome all of you to hear about the research that our amazing interns have done this summer. And um, this is the 26th year of the Summer Systematics Institute, um, and it's been an amazing tradition, an amazing experience for all of us to host interns all of those years, and this year um, especially. We've been really excited to be back in person in our building doing research here um, together, which is different than last year. So um, we just want to encourage you to ask questions and listen. So type in the chat your questions um, and join us as we celebrate our amazing students. Yeah, I think, you know, we just want to want to mention that this has been an awesome year. We had over 450 people apply to participate in this program, uh, which means that of the students selected, we have a we have a more competitive application rate than Stanford University. So <laughs> these students were really the absolute cream of the crop, the best of the best. And we're really excited to, to hear about what they've been up to all summer because we, we don't necessarily know. Uh, we <laughs> steward them into the room and, and then let 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 all of our curators and amazing biodiversity scientists at the academy take over and and really work one on one with these students to uh, to learn how to do research for the first time. Uh, both Rebecca and I were REU participants when we were undergraduates, um, and it's something that really shaped our careers. and And I think um, as the students heard from an alumni panel of the like a group of twenty of like ten five people. <laughs> from the last 20, from the last 25 years uh like the paths that people take after leaving RU are varied and different but certainly are all um recogn recognizing in the fact that that the participation in a program like this is significant in 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 your experiences and in your life moving forward yeah so so please uh ask feel free to ask questions um we'll take questions from 
the audience. We have a live audience here as well as, as through our, our YouTube stream uh, at the end of each presentation. Uh, and we have a, a lineup of five incredible presentations this morning, followed by a, a two hour break and then a second session this, this afternoon. All right, so now we're gonna have a few words from our Chief of Science, um, Dr. Shannon Bennett, um, and then we'll hear from the students. Hi, everybody. There's an X marks in the spot. This is my first hybrid meeting that I've been a part of, so this is pretty exciting. So I'm the Chief of Science at the Academy, and I wanna just reflect uh, on how important this program is and you all are to this institution. So uh, as, a, as the director of science, we understand that science is a creative process fraught with mistakes and new discoveries. And going through that is such an important um, uh, period of discovery, not only for the PIs that are involved in this program, but also for you all. So I wanna thank you deeply for being partners in the process of being a scientist and science communicators. And I will say, we couldn't do it without you. So the, the highlight for a PI, for a, when I was able to take on students, and I know this was true of all of the investigators in this room, is to really see the scientific process carry out and mentor that process through in partnership with you. You great folks, you learners, you're very special people, you, you, you new members of the Academy family, and you'll never be able to leave. You are now a part <laughs> of the Academy family and your scientists and science communicators that will take the lessons you learn over the summer with you forever. And I want to acknowledge that it's it's part of the process to make mistakes. I've heard some of the struggles. I've walked down B2 and heard some of the kerfuffles. That is part of it. We all go through it. The PIs will tell you that they've gone through it. They continue to go through it. And so that's part of it. You own it and you move forward and it makes you a better scientist or science communicator. So thank you all for being here. I want to thank Rebecca and Lauren for being the amazing leaders they are, and Laurel Allen and Aria for all of our amazing team. And I wanna just uh, thank you for joining us this summer and taking this incredible journey with us as one step in your arc to becoming scientists and science communicators. So thank you. Let the games begin. Thanks so much, Shannon. Um, so I am happy to introduce our first speaker, um, Chloe Chinadurai from Vassar College, and um, she will be talking about the morphological diversity and phylogenetics of California deep sea corals. Come on up, Chloe. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, so my project this summer was about uh, what Rebecca just said, um, <laughs> morphological and phylogenetics of um, an out like analysis of deep sea corals um, with Dr. Gary Williams. Um, all right, so a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. Um, first, I'll give a little introduction to these specific corals, um, talk about the purpose of my work this summer, and then um, go over the methods and the most exciting part, the results, and then um, give the conclusion and finally like acknowledgments and time for questions. All right, so. Um, an introduction. So the corals I was working with this summer are octocorals. Um, octocorals are cnidarians in the class Anthozoa. Um, the, the, it's a subclass of Anthozoa. Um, the other subclasses have the hard corals and anemones and also tube dwelling anemones. Um, but uh, all of my specimens were octocorals. Um, and then within Octocoralia, there are three orders, but there are five important groups for the specimens I was working with. Um, Alcyonacea is one of the orders, which has four of the groups in it. Uh, Alcyonina, Calaxonia, Holaxonia, and Sclerexonia. Um, Helioparacea is another sub-order, sub um, or sub another order, but it only has one extant species, um, which wasn't included in um, this survey. And then the last order is C. pens or Penetalacea. All right, so um, the bathymetry and biogeography. Um, octocorals are found all over the world from the Arctic to the tropics, and they're also found at all depths of the ocean. Um, 
this little figure, um, the orange figure in the middle um, is one uh, that Gary made, but it shows the record holders for the deepest corals ever found. Um, and you can see uh, two of them are octocorals. Uh, so um, they can be found um, below 6,000 meters. Um, yeah, and then uh, some morphology to go over. Um, so octocorals are colonies of polyps um, and they have eight fold symmetry, hence the name. Um, and you can see the eight tentacles on the polyps in that, in that top picture. And then um, an important morphological detail that I looked at were um, the sclerites, which are microscopic calcium carbonate um, little structures that are in the soft tissue of octocorals. And they're used for structure in the octocorals, but the reason they're important is because they help um, identify the octocoral species um, when they look the same. And you can see a little picture of their very diverse in shape at the bottom there. Um, and just a little bit more morphology. Um, so octocorals are colonies. So you can see this image has um, three polyps on it, but obviously there's a lot of polyps on a whole octocoral. Um, but I just wanted to point out um, that uh, they have this axial skeleton um, in the middle of the dark part, and um, it's uh, made of either cal uh, calcium carbonate or protein or a mix of those things, and that is what the groups are like named based on. Um, so I just wanted to show what that looks like. All right, so my purpose of uh, research this summer was a survey of the morphology and phylogeny of 15 exemplar California deep sea octocoral specimens. Um, and uh, here you can see um, four in situ pictures of the specimens that I was working with. Um, and you can see they're very beautiful when they're alive. They're a little bit less beautiful when they're dead, but um, yeah. All right, um, so methods. Um, first for morphology, I took, um, I looked at the sclerites under a, a compound microscope and uh, through SE scanning electron microscope imaging. And also I took photos of all the specimens. Um, and then for molecular work, I um, extracted the DNA. Um, there were five genes I was looking at. Um, but there were only three segments of DNA, and it was mitochondrial DNA. Um, and then purification and pr precipitation in order to do sequencing. And then um, for phylogenetics, I did two phylogenetic analyses, Bayesian inference and maximum likelihood. Um, and you'll see all those later. All right, so um, some of the results. So here's um, the overview of the morphology. Um, so I'm going to go through it by group. The first group was whole axonia, um, which is defined as being um, apart from one family um, and having an axis made of protein and calcareous material um, with a hollow core. And so these are my specimens. Um, you can see there's Swiftia, Euborgia, and Chromoplexera. Um, uh, they were mostly whole specimens, except Euborgia is just a, a tissue sample. Um, yes. All right, and so here is an example of um, what the sclerites look like. Um, on the left, on the right, I'm sorry, you have, um, no, on the left, my <laughs> right. <laughs> you have the um, SEM images, and on the right, so sorry, um, is the compound microscope image. Um, you can see there's a little bit of diversity in the shape of the sclerites. Um, for this species, but they mostly look the same. Um, you can see in the top SEM image, there uh, is like some symmetry, um, which is cool. And uh, just to give you an idea of the scale, like the sclerites look like dust on the slide. Um, and you can see the scale in the SEM images is 40 micrometers. So they're very small. And um, yeah, and the compound microscope uh, image can give you an idea of the color. All right, so the next group, Alcyonina, um, are corals with no central axis. Um, I had two specimens in this group, Heteropolypus and Drosemia. Um, so here are the sclerites from Drosemia. You can see there's a little bit more diversity in the sclerite shape, um, but still all like long and, and have those like warty 
um, bits sticking out. Um, yes, and you can see the color is a little bit different from the previous chromoflexura. Um, the next group is scleraxonia, um, which is defined by um, the axis or axial structure, um, as well as the medulla contains sclerites. So the whole thing contains sclerites. Um, and there's only one specimen in this group, Paragorgia, and this group kind of served as an outgroup for the phylogeny. Um, and here you can see um, an image of the Paragorgia um, sclerites. Uh, the, it's a little messy. The messiness on it is the tissue that's left over that didn't get washed off by the bleach. And um, and yeah, you can see the color. It's kind of orangey. Um, okay, so the next group, Calixonia, had a lot of my um, specimens. It is defined as having a solid excess that contains a lot of a large amount of calcareous material. Um, so. Uh, you can see keratosis, radicipes, norella, caligorgia, and nicella, and peristinella, which was too big for me to get out of the jar to take a nice picture of. <laughs> um, uh, yes. All right. So here are the sclerites from nicella. You can see these have kind of a, a, a very different shape from the other ones. They're kind of barbell shaped, and there's diversity in that, um, but they're all kind of barbell shaped. Um, and the top left image is uh, a close-up of the um, little warty parts of the uh, the dumbbell, and you can see those sclerites are yellow. Um, and then I also wanted to show um, this is a whole mount uh, SEM images of Peristinella, um, and um, it's still very small. You can see it's 500 micrometers is the scale. Um, but uh, since it has the calcareous material um, throughout, it has these kind of really beautiful scales. I just wanted to show that too. Um, yes, and then the last group is Penitalacia. Um, and it's defined as having one central calcium, calcium carbonate axial rod and having two kinds of polyps. Um, the smaller ones are for water circulation and the larger ones are for feeding um, and reproduction. Um, and these are the C pens. Um, you can see they kind of look like feathers, which is why they're called that. And um, uh, I had three specimens in this in this group, Tylosarcus, Balthacina, and Distichoptilum. Um, Yes, and then uh, here are the Tylosarcus um, sclerites, and you can see there's kind of a lot more diversity in these shapes of sclerites. Um, there are the really small um, monomorphic ones that are in the bottom left, um, and you can see there the little clear ones in the compound microscope image, and then there are the larger ones. Um, on the bottom right is kind of a club-shaped one, and then the um, top left is the like a spheroid one and you can see they're also different colors which is cool and interesting um yes and so now um here is the phylogeny that i came up with um or i didn't come up with it from the analysis and the structure of this tree is from um the ml uh analysis but the bayesian um numbers are underneath so you can see both um, some important things that i wanted to point out um, first the bayesian tree had a polytomy um, with the bottom three clades so uh, right over there uh, but and that is reflected in um, the ml numbers you can see there's it's really low um, 34 and like 50 something um, over there um, Second, um, so uh, Penitalacia and Holoxonia are both monophyletic in this phylogeny, um, but Calixonia is not monophyletic. You can see um, one got all the way to the bottom, uh, mixed in with Alcyonina, um, which is interesting, and um, that also um, makes Alcyonina um, not monophyletic either. Um, yeah. All right, so um, some conclusions. Uh, Calixonia was shown to be paraphyletic um, 
while other studies have found it to be monophyletic, uh, so that's definitely um, an interesting and important finding from this, and uh, Penitalacea and Holaxonia are both monophyletic groups. Um, and some future directions, um, so this is just kind of a, a survey of, of exemplar specimens, but um, definitely including more taxa and adding more genes uh, to resolve the polytomy um, would be the next steps. And then especially including more calyxonians to um, see where they fall in terms of being monophyletic or um, paraphyletic. And then also expanding the geography beyond just California um, would be uh, interesting and important as well. Um, and then uh, just my acknowledgments, uh, Dr. Gary Williams, my advisor, and um, Lynn and Sam, who helped me so much with my project, um, Dr. Sarah Cruz, who taught us phylogenetics, and Dr. Um, Esposito and Dr. Johnson for running SSI. Um, thank you so much. And all the other SSI interns and my friends and family um, who have been so supportive. And then um, the RU program, uh, Cal Academy, and my college, Vassar College. Um, yeah, so thank you. And <laughs> any questions? For one thing, if you take questions from the audience, Chloe, can you make sure to repeat the question? Yes. Um, one question came to my mind was, did you have a chance to look at the morphological characters that you examined to see if they correlated with the phylogeny at all? Um, yes, I did look at that a little bit. I'll go back to this slide. Um, or I thought about it at least. Oh. The question was, I'm sorry, uh, did I uh, get a chance to look at the morphological characters uh, uh, along with the phylogeny? Um, so it's interesting, the um, uh, corals that don't have an axis are way up at the bottom of the tree or like have were um, evolved later, which is interesting. Uh, it kind of uh, points to the fact that they lost that trait. Um, and also, um, the whole axonia are the ones with protein in the axis, and it looks like that was a trait that was gained because um, the earlier ones just have calcareous material. So that's just what I thought about, um, but I didn't do any like analysis about that. So. It the tree looks pretty good, except for that really troublesome Calixonia group, right? That's causing a lot of the trouble. So, and of course, this is a, a gene tree of mitochondrial genes. So, do you have a feeling for why Calixonia um, might be misbehaving relative to the other <laughs> in terms of this gene tree? Um, I am not sure. Um, part of me. Oh, sorry. The question was, <laughs> um, do I have any idea about why Calixonia is um, kind of all spread out throughout the tree and not uh, monophyletic? Um, part of me is wondering if I made a mistake somewhere labeling something, at least with Nicella. I'm not sure if that happened. Um, but it also might not be a mistake um, it's possible that the naming is just not reflective of the evolutionary history. And um, it's also possible that these specific specimens just are the like outliers and most of the group would be monophyletic. I'm not sure um, exactly why they don't. And also, um, it's uh, Radicipes specifically, that was part of that polytomy. So um, there wasn't a ton of uh, enough data to really conclusively say which clade those belong in. So um, that would definitely be part of resolving that too. I think we were able to add more specimens to that polytomy, especially Radicipes in, in that group. It might show that we included those species. Yeah, uh, Gary, uh, my advisor, just said um, if we added more of um, Calixonians, it would uh, help to resolve that that um, the polytomy and the 
a problem of it being monophyletic or paraphyletic. Lauren. All right, this is not my question. This okay. Is a question from Skylar Knight, who's a black woman. Uh, and he asks, are there any theories about why the sclerites exhibit so much morphological differences? Um, oh, so the question was um, uh, if there are any theories about uh, whether the why the sclerites have so much morphological diversity and I do not know the answer to that question. <laughs> um, yeah. That's great answer. Um, there's also a bunch of congratulations. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, in species with multiple types of sclerites, do you see a concentration of a particular type of sclerite in relation to the organism? Like are the tips one kind of sclerite and maybe the body wall is something else? Um, yes, I, uh, the question was, uh, in species with multiple kinds of sclerites, um, do the different kinds come from different parts of the animal? Um, and yes, is the answer to that. I do believe I didn't, um, do, uh, like I only took sclerites from one part of each specimen, but in like the reading that I did, um, it's definitely true that, uh, different parts of the animal have different kinds of sclerites. Um, so yeah. I have a question for you. Yes. So um, I'm wondering, are there, these are all deep sea, so I'm wondering hmm. if there are shallow water aquifers that are related and could you add those to the tree or do we know that there's like in the same groups? Um, so that's my question. Yeah. Uh, so the question was, are there shallow water um, Octocorals that are related to these ones uh, in the same groups that could be added to the tree. And I believe that there are, but I am not 100% sure. Um, maybe. Yes. <laughs> it has been confirmed there are other octocorals that are shallow water in this. Yeah. They, you would have to go, um, Dr. Williams just said, you'd have to go outside of California to find them, but there are plenty. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Chloe. Um, next up, we have a combined presentation by um, Haley Schmidt from the University of Texas at San Antonio and Natalie Beckman Smith from California State University, Northridge. And they will be talking about changes in plant and evolution and avian communities post fire in the Capel's Creek watershed. Welcome up, you guys. All right. Let me pull this off real quick. <laughs> I was ready to go. Um, all right, well, good morning, everybody. Um, like Rebecca said, we're gonna be talking a little bit about the community changes that we observed post-fire in the Capels Creek watershed. So there's been an ongoing research project between the Cal Academy, the US Forest Service, and several other organizations um, in the El Dorado National Forest, which is located in the Sierra Nevada. As part of this project, uh, we were sent out to a field site along the Silver Fork of the American River for about two weeks in the middle of June uh, with an awesome crew of biologists that you can see here um, <laughs> to try to learn how fire affects biodiversity. So with this presentation, we're going to take you through a brief history of our study area, uh, the purpose of the project, our summer research, and some future plans. Um, and before we continue, we wanted to quickly acknowledge that our data and our field work was conducted on land that belonged to the Washoe and Nisanon tribes. Um, and we're going to get into further detail towards the end, but we wanted to acknowledge that first um, before we talk about anything else. So to start off with the Sierra Nevada, um, they actually formed a lot earlier than we previously thought, um, about 40 million years ago during the Eocene. Um, and today they stretch along the eastern border of California and they incorporate more than a quarter of California's land area. They actually encompass three national parks, uh, including Yosemite, Kings Canyon, and Sequoia. 60% um, of California's mean annual precipitation falls in the Sierras. Um, which makes us a really important source of water to the entire state. And it actually provides water to about 23 million people from San Francisco to LA. 
Uh, the cirrus also support 66% of bird and mammal species and about half of reptile, reptile and amphibian species found in the entire state of California. And within the Sierras, the Cable Creek watershed um, is an area south of Lake Tahoe, and it's within the El Dorado National Forest. Um, you can see a little map over here, too. <laughs> um, and what makes this area special is that there's been no significant disturbance for over 80 years, which includes no logging um, and actively suppressing fire, which has led to this watershed having some really awesome old growth Sierra habitat. Um, but this has also led to an accumulation of significant fuels in the form of dead trees and layers of old vegetation. Um, and this excess fuel has threatened to destroy the entirety of the forest if a fire was started, regardless of if it was man-made or completely naturally caused. And in addition to wildfires clearing out the accumulated fuels, many species in the Sierras are adapted to fire and actually rely on it. Um, some of these photos here are pictures that we actually took out in the field of some fire dependent species. Um, for example, this black backed woodpecker, which are notoriously hard to see. Um, <laughs> and if y'all can't see it, he's right there. <laughs> um, with a little inset picture right there to see a, a better picture of what they look like when they're not covered in soot and charcoal. Um, and we also have a picture of a lodgepole pine. Um, these trees have serotonous cones which means their cones don't actually fully open until um, they've been exposed to fire and then they can release the seeds and start to germinate. Um, and historically in the area, fire was ignited by lightning um, or indigenous people that lived there. And this was really common prior to the 20th century. And we'd see these cycles about every 20 years or so um, throughout a broad zone from the foothills to the mixed conifer forests of the Sierra. So the Caples Creek Ecological Restoration Project was designed by the United States Forest Service to reintroduce periodic fire to the landscape in order to increase forest health and resilience. And resilience is the ability of a system to respond to disturbance and maintain identity, such as its structure and function. So for example, a forest still looking like, acting like, and being a forest even after a fire. So the original plan was to burn the watershed over a period of four years, but this happened. So the fire was originally prescribed in late September 2019. However, it got out of hand due to high winds and was officially classified as a wildfire in October. And the fire ended up burning across the entire site. But this is arguably a good thing in some ways. So one way that this is good is the fire created a mosaic across the landscape. So here you can see a picture of the burn severity and you can really see the pyrodiversity. So that means that it didn't just get uniformly burned. It has several different areas of different burn severity. And another good thing you could say is this kind of accomplished four years of work in one year. And then <laughs> a third good thing that could come out of this is this could possibly be sort of a first glance at what future management techniques will look like as we move away from fire suppression and towards fire reintroduction. So that brings us to the research side of the Caples Creek Restoration Project. The science team had been collecting pre-fire data since 2017, and they could now collect post-fire data after the 2019 burn. They currently have, at this moment, three years of pre-fire data and two years of post-fire data. And the study aims to ask and answer questions such as, how resilient are these old growth forests to fire? How does fire affect the structure, function, or composition of forests? How do management treatments affect avian biodiversity? How well does biodiversity act as a measure of resilient or healthy forests? And how does biodiversity contribute to resilient forests? And that brings us back to our 2021 summer research project, two years post fire. So these are some of the pictures of what it looked like while we were there. We saw a range of different habitats and burn severities. There were a lot of down trees and there's a picture of Haley getting over a gigantic down tree. And a lot of the trees there are covered in you know, charcoal and ash. And we saw lots of stands of trees that were completely blackened and burned, like the picture at the bottom. But we also saw a lot of areas that were completely unburned. And these areas had these amazing, huge, ancient trees. So I'll briefly touch on the, the field work that we did. We camped at the study site for two weeks. 
And together, Haley and I surveyed 23 plant points and the bird team surveyed 82 avian points. And the question that we wanted to help answer is how resilient are these old growth forests to fire? So Haley explored this by looking into how the plant community changed post fire, while I looked into how the bird community changed post fire. All right, that's my cue. <laughs> so to answer that plant question, we had three main um, ways we wanted to go about this. Um, firstly, with the plant surveys that we accomplished on site, we were collaborating with the US Forest Service for this aspect of the project. And so we went out to the sites that they had previously surveyed um, across a variety of different burn severities. And you can see the designations for these severities here. Um, and for plant purposes, these severities were within the 11.3 meter transects that we were looking at. Um, while we were at each site, we also took note of the field conditions and the dominant plant species that were present there. We also took, um, we used a, a technique called photo vouchering to generate a species list. Um, so we took pictures of every single species that we found within our transects. Uh, and this was especially useful because you can't always immediately identify every single little leafy thing that you find. Um, so we were able to take a ton of pictures of everything. Um, and with those pictures, we put them onto iNaturalist so we could get a little bit of help with identification on some of the trickier species. Um, and this worked really, really well. You can see a little screen capture here. Um, in the bottom corner of, of some of the species that we saw. Um, and now beyond just identifying them, those pictures are gonna be stored on iNaturalist for future use with other projects or really just by anybody who's interested in what's growing in the Sierras. And before I get into the data, I wanted to just go over a couple of the terms I'm going to be throwing around a lot. Um, so starting off with the forbs, these are the things that most people are probably very familiar with. Um, they are any sort of herbaceous flowering plant other than a graminoid, um, which graminoids are really just any sort of grassy uh, thing like a, a grass or a sedge or a rush. Um, we also saw quite a few shrubs, which are woody plants, which may also flower, um, that are usually less than eight meters in height. And they have this sort of structure where they all form from a, a central point and have multiple stems that arrive, um, that arise and create this sort of bushy structure. Um, and of course, you can't go to the forest and not see trees. So we, um, <laughs> I think we all know what tree is, but it's all just um, a woody plant with a, a one stem, a trunk um, that forms a crown of foliage. And so all of those different life forms and all of the different species that we saw, we can see very quickly that um, the number of species generally increase post fire. So this graph that you're looking at right now shows all of the different sites that we went to across the bottom um, and the observations that we saw at each one. And the bars are shaded to show if they were pre or post fire and are color coordinated to show the burn severity. Um, so the, the purple ones are the most highly burned and the, the red ones are the, the least burned. Um, we thought this was really interesting because you can see that, especially for fire severities two, three, and four, that the, um, the species really increased. Um, but we wanted to know if that trend is applicable to all species, if um, this trend of the fire increasing um, affected everything indiscriminately or if there was a difference. Um, so we broke it down this way and we can see that the answer is no. Um, while the, the data suggested that trees decrease, the forbs actually really increase. And, um, remember the forbs are the flowery little things. And this is what we can see happened pre and post fire um, overall. But we do have another variable here that we wanted to look at um, and that's fire severity. So we can see the breakdown based on that as well. So here we have fire severities one and two. Um, again, the same layout as before. And we can see pretty quickly that there wasn't a huge change for fire severity one, um, although it does slightly follow that trend that we were talking about but we do start to see a little bit more of a dramatic shift for fire severity too. And then we get into fire severities three and four, and we start to see things get a little bit more crazy with bigger shifts um, between the pre and post conditions. Um, and so we can see this pattern following along all of the sites. And this is likely due to the fire clearing out a lot of the really densely forested areas, um, which allows for the understory to get more sunlight um, and increase the growth. And aside from physically clearing out some space for these new plants, um, some species actually require that fire to germinate. And so that may also be responsible for the uptick in, in forbs that we saw. Now, this one's a lot, um, <laughs> but we can 
pretty quickly see exactly which species are unique to pre and post fire conditions. Um, this is just a list of all of the species with a dot indicating if it was present um, before or after the fire. Um, so the dots are what really matter here <laughs> more than all the little tiny words. Um, and so this plot, however, does represent a very conservative approach to this question of which species were affected, um, because we did have a variety of unknown species. Um, and this can happen for a whole bunch of different reasons, um, such as the, the plants being immature and we can't really see very much of the actual plant, um, or even just things as human as poor image quality. We were taking these pictures out in the middle of nowhere with no internet. <laughs> so it, it happens. Um, and, but these unknowns can really inflate the number of species observed. And we did see this happen on pre and post fire data sets um, because both of them had unknown observations. Um, and so to take that into account here, we really wanted to acknowledge that some of the unknowns may be repeated entries of known species that we already had, um, but some may have truly been new species. We just couldn't get an actual name on them. Um, and so we adjusted our lists accordingly um, because we just don't definitively know one way or another, but we believe this is the most conservative approach to that, that problem. Um, in addition to the whole unknown problem, um, there's also a lot of other factors that can affect the data, um, such as the training and background of the observer. Um, like I mentioned, the pre-fire data was collected by the Forest Service. Um, and then we collected the post-fire data. So that's two very different backgrounds um, coming from a forestry background versus a botany background. You may notice different things within each plot. Um, the season and the phonology of the surveys can also affect what's, what's detected. Um, depending on the time of year that you go, you may see more or less plant species. Um, for example, we went in the middle of June. So we saw quite a lot of um, different flowers and such. But if we had gone in the middle of December, it would be quite a different story. Um, so that's something to really keep in mind. As well as the time frame for the survey, um, ours were all conducted within a two week period. But if we had stretched out our surveys over the course of say two months, we may have had even more variability just between sites, um, let alone across the years. Um, and all of these factors are really important to take into account because this, in this information is really important. Uh, plant diversity is vital to ecosystem health. Um, as I'm sure most of us know, plants provide a variety of ecosystem services, such as the prevention of erosion, protection of watersheds, and providing habitat for the animals that live in the forest. Um, and in areas that have been subject to decades of fire prevention, we see dense forests where tree branches actually reach all the way to the forest floor. Uh, so not only does this prevent other species from moving in, but it creates these conditions for fire to spread even more quickly and be more devastating to everything in the forest. Um, in contrast, areas that have not been uh, suppressed with their fire, we see the creation of patchwork forests with meadows and shrub fields scattered throughout, which allows for more species diversity at all levels, um, including birds. Yay, birds. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start off by explaining how the bird data was collected at Caples. There were two main methods, point counts and ARUs. So Point counts were conducted from around 5.30 to 9.15 in the morning, and that meant that the bird team would have to get up before sunrise to hike out to their designated point clusters. And Haley and I were lucky enough to join them on many of these excursions and learn the ways. And once there, we would stand silently at the point and we would write down every single species of bird that we saw or heard, along with other information like how far away they were and how many of them there were and what kind of vocalizations they were making. And we would do this for two periods of five minutes before quickly moving on to the next point. The second method that the bird team used were ARUs or automated recording units. So these are audio recorders that were set up at the points and they would record 15 minutes of audio twice an hour, every hour. And then these audio recordings are fed into this super cool machine learning AI program that is being trained to identify bird calls by looking at their waveforms. But for my summer research project specifically, I focused on using the point count data. So I wanted to look at the overall pattern across bird species at the site to see how fire affected them. And coming from Los Angeles, I was kind of raised with this idea that fire is bad and that you know, it, it negatively impacts wildlife even when it's naturally caused. So in the back of my mind, I kind of expected to see that species diversity would have decreased after the fire, at least initially. 
However, I was surprised to see that this was not the case at all. So here I mapped the change in average naive occupancy pre and post fire for each species. And naive occupancy is the number of points that the species was detected at. So the naive occupancy is on the y-axis and then the list of the species is on the x-axis. And as you can see, the majority of species actually increased after the fire. Next, I wanted to look more closely at the patterns in which species changed occupancy post-fire. So this graph is looking at species that increased in 2020 above their maximum pre-fire occupancy. So the occupancy for all the pre-fire years, 2017, 18, and 19, are the green bars, and they have error bars that represent the pre-fire min and max. And then the 2020 occupancy is in orange, and 2021 is in purple. And as you can see, 29 species increased above their pre-fire occupancy in 2020, directly following the fire. So that's a, a ton of species. I also saw some trends within the species that increased. So some species like this lovely mountain quail, for example, increased occupancy in 2020, and then their occupancy remained above pre-fire levels in 2021. Other species like the black-backed woodpecker that Haley showed you on the tree and the red crossbill were never observed in the study site until after the fire. So they're like new arrivals. Another trend that I noticed was many species like the Stellar's jay increased directly after the fire, but their knife occupancy returned back to the pre-fire levels by 2021. Next, I graphed all the species that had 2020 occupancy levels that remained within their pre-fire range. And I found that 35 species followed this trend. So another huge amount of species. And some species like the golden crowned kinglet maintained occupancy levels within their pre-fire range for both, both post-fire years. Other species like the white-headed woodpecker and the lazuli bunting had occupancy levels that were within the pre-fire range in 2020, but increase above it in 2021. So the lazuli bunting specifically was somewhat uncommon at the study site pre-fire. It was not detected at all directly after the fire in 2020. And then it was seen on more points than it ever has been in 2021. So it's a really interesting pattern. And the Cassin's vireo was the only species that maintained its pre-fire occupancy in 2020, but decreased below it in 2021. So that's kind of interesting. And finally, I graphed all the species that decreased directly following the fire. So many species. <laughs> there are just only four of them that showed this decline. And they were the band-tailed pigeon, the Pacific wren, the white-breasted nuthatch, and the Williamson sapsucker. And all but one regained occupancy levels within their pre-fire range in 2021. So it only took two years after the fire for them to just, boop, you know, go back to normal. And the band-tailed pigeon appears to be the only species continuing to decline. So here I decided to show the numbers of species that fit into each trend. The darker the box, the more species in it. And I have whether they increased, stayed the same, or decreased in 2020 as sort of the x-axis, and whether they increased, stayed the same, or decreased in 2021 as the y-axis. And most species fit into that upper left-hand corner with no decline below pre-fire levels in either post-fire year. And here it is with some of the example species that I've been showing you. And I also turned these species numbers into a pie chart so that you can kind of see the percentages a little better. So 42.6% of species increased directly after the fire, 51.5% remained within pre-fire levels, and only 5.9% decreased. Now, all that I have showed you is looking at trends for the entire study site over the years. And these changes in naive occupancy could have been and probably were affected by many different interannual factors other than fire, such as drought, climate, food availability, etc. So I wanted to look specifically at what effect fire had on avian biodiversity. So to do this, I looked at how species richness, or the number of species, of each study point in the site changed over the years and separated them by the burn severity of the points. So each gray box is a different burn severity rating and each color is a different year. 
And looking at the graph by itself, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. It looks like maybe there's like a trend of increasing richness across time, but it's kind of hard to tell just from looking at it. What is interesting is that very preliminary mixed effects modeling suggests that burn severity has a significant positive effect on avian species richness, even when accounting for annual variation. So it looks like when burn severity increased, so did the bird diversity, and that's very exciting. Uh, the takeaway from all this is that birds seem to be doing very well post-fire. Fire definitely did not cause a catastrophic collapse of avian diversity or anything close to that. And we found a potential positive relationship between burn severity and species richness, but we need to do more complex occupancy modeling to really parse apart and truly see how fire specifically affects bird species. And in the future, we can also use the ARU data to get a more accurate picture of occupancy levels for bird species that are maybe harder to detect or ones that are nocturnal and not picked up during the morning point counts and things like that. And we also need one more year of post-fire data before we have three on either side. And then you can do like a mean of pre and a mean of post and really compare those two directly. So that will be exciting to see in the future. Mm -hmm. So in conclusion, uh, fire we, we found that fire is a necessary component for eco ecosystem health. Uh, because it facilitates biodiversity of plants and birds. Um, with the, the plants, we found that the greatest changes in plant community structure were seen in fire severities three and four. And we actually documented 70 um, species that were not present before the fire. And as for the avian findings, more data and analyses are needed to see how fire truly is affecting the bird community at Cables. But for now, we can pretty confidently say that fire has not had a negative impact on avian diversity and might have uh, had a positive impact on species richness. And overall, our findings from the Cables study appear to support the notion that these old growth forests are resilient to fire. And we are excited to see what the third year of post-fire data has to show us. Um, and like I mentioned at the beginning, we really wanted to acknowledge that our fieldwork was conducted on land that was taken from the Washoe and Isanon tribes. Uh, the people of these tribes have historically always lived on that land and cared for it, um, and they will always continue to care for this land. Um, and we wanted to recognize that although the, although the Washoe tribe is federally recognized, uh, the Nisanon are no longer of that status, and you can support them online through either of their websites, which we have listed here. And we'd like to give a special thanks to the Caples Project team, which includes the US Forest Service, UC Davis, and Google for letting us use some of their data and for having a great time with us in the field. We'd like to thank the National Science Foundation for funding the SSI program, our universities, UTSA and CSUN for giving us the foundation necessary to complete this program successfully. We'd like to thank the Cal Academy, of course, and our advisors, Sarah Jacobs, Jack Dumbacher and Darrell Coppen for inviting us here and mentoring us all summer, as well as Lauren Esposito and Rebecca Johnson and Lynn Bonobo for organizing this program. And of course, we want to say thank you to our families for supporting our journeys in science since day one. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>
just because I don't think we had enough data on that specifically. Yes, you agree? but we we started to build this like kind of combination database that groups the birds into guilds and it would inform us of maybe what type of plant resource they're using, like what kind of nesting habitat do they use? Do they nest up in trees or do they nest in shrubs? And we're hoping that in the future we can use that to kind of look at the relationship. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. It's a great talk. I love, and I really enjoy being in the field with you. <laughs> to see it in action. Um, I, uh, you know, one of the rationales for reintroducing fire into landscapes is to uh, eliminate the the big mega fire phenomenon, which, I, my understanding is that it's both intense in severity and it's a hom hom homogeneous burn landscape. So can you reflect on your findings that severity, increasing severity seems to be a good thing, and yet I'm imagining there's a, there's a limit um, to how severe it is. Do you want to take that? So you're, you're <laughs> asking how could there be more diversity at these super high intensity sites? Especially if we're trying to reduce severity over landscapes. So Does I th it suggest we should keep going? Oh, <laughs> I see. <laughs> I don't know because we didn't see a limit. You know, we did see that. Well, did you in the plants see like a, a little limit? bit? Um, so something that was really helpful with this fire is because there was that mosaic of different severities. Um, we saw different things at each site within the severity. So um, for example, when you have this high fire and it clears out a lot of stuff, hopefully eventually, you know, maybe you'll get some like meadowy type things. Um, and a lot of that comes from the seed bank. So if there's seeds stored in the in the soil, it's going to take some pretty high temperatures to really germinate those seeds. Um, but I, I think it, it's more so important that we get that mosaic of different levels of burn severity so we can um, have a more diverse landscape. Do you? Yeah. I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that makes sense. Sure. Okay. I had kind of a follow up question to that question. So, um, so I'm just wondering, I know you all didn't look at this and it's like a much larger project, but do you think there's like an adjacency of different burn severity, like something that would like to kind of, like Shannon's talking about the paper was all for category, mm -hmm. like what would it look like would might be quite different than having this mosaic? So I wonder if there's a way you could look at like the difference, the patchwork and the effect on different patches yeah. and patch size maybe. Yeah. That's not a long question, and maybe it's not really a question, but that seems like <laughs> <laughs> I think so too. Do you mean like having, like the the patching of having like a, a burn severity one near like yeah. a three yeah. kind of exactly. thing? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not really. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like sum up what you think. <laughs> so, to repeat what you're saying, you want like what would be <laughs> not just looking at the burn severity separately, but their combined combined yeah. effect next to each other. And I think we were talking about how that could be a future study because it kind of mimics when you're looking at like alpha diversity versus beta diversity yeah. like between different points so that would be yeah, interesting so um i have a bird related question um so it looks like the kind of biggest loser in terms of um population decline was the bandit yeah, the band tilled pigeon. Um, so is that, you know, a species we should be looking at conservation efforts in? Or like, if, you know, given that fires are going to keep happening, like are we sort of thinking about what that species is going to be going through? So the question is, should we be concerned about the band tailed pigeon if we move forward with doing more fire reintroduction? I would, I don't know the answer, but I, would guess no. The, the band-tailed pigeon, I don't think, is a species that is of concern at the moment. And I think it it's not like it's being killed by the fire, I would say. I think it just moves from place to place to find food. And it primarily eats acorns, so perhaps it's just moving to where there are other acorns. And so if, if fire is done in a way where, you know, maybe not everything is burned uniformly all across the board, I think they could probably move around and, and have habitat. So I want to build on Shen's question and Rebecca's question. Um, and if you were going to design a study, sort of a next level study, that would look at the impact of fire on biodiversity in this ecosystem, 
how would you do it to, to think about, you know, we know that we're facing these potentially giant mega fires going forward, but we're also thinking about controlled burns to get rid of fuel. So those are two extremes. Obviously, we want to be able to give um, some advice to people on how to move forward. How would you design a study to test what kinds of fire regimes might be um, ideal for this kind of ecosystem? Hmm. That's a good question. <laughs> um, um, the question was asked, um, how would we design a study that would um, incorporate the, the things that we have found from like these, these huge mega fires, right? And the controlled burns and how would we move forward in this kind of ecosystem, correct? Yeah. Um, it has to be a pretty big study. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> For sure. Um, but I think that this is definitely the beginning, though. Like, this is like where it all starts. And there are so many things at play because we do care about the ecosystem health and, you know, the plants and the animals, but we care about people too. You know, we can't just be burning down people's neighborhoods and things like that. So, you know, <laughs> we have, we can't just let fire go super crazy. Mm -hmm. So it is like a balancing act. And, and I think we did see a little bit of that within this project specifically um, because it did start off as a prescribed burn mm -hmm. um, that kind of evolved into this, this larger fire. Um, so I'm not saying that I hope all of our prescribed burns go crazy, but um, I feel like this kind of represents a, a, a good medium, perhaps, between the two, um, two methods of starting fire in the woods. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Well done. Really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great talk. So I had a question. I'm not super familiar with fire ecology or systems like that, but overall it looks like for local plants and birds that there was like a increased post fire and I was just interested in what kind of reasons why that might be is the idea that maybe there's this like kind of open niche that can now be kind of tapped into or if there are maybe people are avoiding these areas and so that could also potentially be a factor because people generally would prefer to hike somewhere that's not like <laughs> yeah. I don't know I would like to hear your thoughts on that sure okay so the question was why does this sort of spike in you know biodiversity happen after fire and um maybe you should start with like the plants like some reasons yeah um so kind of like the talked about at the beginning um some of these plant species actually depend on fire in order to germinate or to flower um, or to release their seeds, kind of um, like with the lodgepole pine, for example, um, those cones depend on the, the the fire to to open and release their seeds. So we would see more um, lodgepole pines perhaps after um, after a fire, um, as well as some seeds that may have been just in the soil um, waiting for fire. And then once that fire comes along, it kind of triggers a, a germination. So then you see this um, sprout in plants afterwards. And for the birds, it's, it is like you said, it's a, probably this like a opening of niches, like that takes away this uniformity and it can be as specific as with the blackback woodpecker, which is like specifically eats beetles that specifically eat, you know, or lay their eggs in burnt bark or burnt wood or to something as general as a, a ground feeding bird having more ground to feed on. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Excellent. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to take a 10 minute break, give okay. everyone a chance both in, in the room and at home to go get some refreshments and do what you need to do. We'll be back. <laughs>
Hi, everyone, and welcome back. And um, we have three more speakers in this morning session. And so I'm really happy to introduce um, Gwendolyn Campbell from Los Medanos College, who will be talking about looking at heteroplasmy in Western North American Castilea. Here you go, Gwen. Hello, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Gwendolyn Campbell. I worked the summer with Dr. Sarah Jacobs on Castilea, otherwise known as paintbrush flowers. Um, to give you a little bit of background of what Castilea exactly is, um, here are two different species of Castilea, and these were both part of the groups that I used for my project. On the right, you can see Castilea midiata, and on the left, you can see Castilea applegati. These are both members of the genus uh, parasitic or bank family. Uh, and these are also species widely found in Western North America. Um, Castilea is, as I mentioned, a parasitic plant, specifically hemiparasitic. And that means it will generally be accompanied by another plant such as the sagebrush in this picture. Um, unlike an obligate, obligate parasite, parasite um, it doesn't require an accompanying plant in order to uh, live out its life cycle essentially. Um, going into what heteroplasmy is and what I was looking for, uh, heteroplasmy is the presence of DNA from multiple sources in an organelle, which in plants can be both mitochondria, which is more widely studied, or the chloroplast. <sighs> Typically, we think of chloroplast as being uniparentally inherited, and we assume that it's maternally inherited in Castilea. We also consider the chloroplast to be non-recombining, and thus the concept of heteroplasmy is unaccepted. Uh, this image describes what heteroplasmy caused by mutation is like. Homoplasmy is a typical state of the cell where they only have one source of DNA. And this is what we would normally expect out of typical Castilea cells. This only has one type of chloroplast, which is represented by the brown pieces in there. These second and third ones are heteroplasmic cells. These have multiple types of chloroplasts, brown ones representing the ones that you would typically find in Castilea cells, and the yellow ones representing mutated ones, or ones from a different source of DNA. Uh, these images also show that heteroplasmy can exist in different ratios, which I'll be touching back on later. Uh, currently, you can see work that Dr. Jacobs had done and which I based the beginnings of my research on. We see pictured an alignment of DNA sequences for the chloroplast gene YCF1 from five different species of Castilea. The different bases between uh, the gene sequences are the ones in color. They're highlighted in red and green and blue and yellow. Um, all the gray bases are exactly the same across the majority of Castilea. Uh, if you look particularly to Castilea arachnoidea, which I have highlighted there, you will see that there are two different versions per each species. But you can also see that with the top one and the bottom one that I have highlighted for Castilea arachnoidea, they differ slightly as far as the which bases are highlighted and which differ from each other. If you look directly below the second arachnoidea into the third alignment, though, you will see that there are places where they match. Several places, in fact. That was basically the basis for me considering the concept of heteroplasmy within these chloroplasts. Um, as far as my methods go, uh, I took samples from a mixture of specimens that my mentor had collected in 2017 in Idaho. And 
Also more recently collected specimens from areas in the Greater Bay Area and, and the Sierra Nevada range in 2021. I extracted DNA from 18 different individuals spanning 15 species, and I used three different primer pairs for three different gene regions that Dr. Jacobs had identified as potentially having heteroplasmy. I sequenced those gene regions for each of those samples. But then we had to look at the sequence DNA. <laughs> and there we ran into a lot of additional challenges. We had issues with low DNA yield. Some primers just didn't seem to work. One in particular was not cooperating at all. And then the sequences that we did get were just incredibly messy in most cases. Um, but when we finally had a set of eight really great quality reads for the 129-130 gene region, we were able to compare these to data that Dr. Jacobs already had for the same gene region. The first thing that we did when we aligned my sequences to Dr. Jacobs was that we looked for patterns in the alignment to see which samples matched. And then we got really excited. <laughs> There was this one pattern that we saw shared across it. You can see with the area that I highlighted that there is a blue double bar. Um, this was shown in one of the two samples in uh, one of the two reads that we got out of the Kusiki eye. That was actually done by my lab mate, Cecilia Alvarado. Lab difficulty. Help me, please. Computer issue. Sorry. It's it's not. No, this. Okay. Sorry, technical. Sorry, delay. there's a little technical <laughs> difficulty, everyone. Okay, back. Wonderful. Thank Good. you. Okay. Okay, getting back to this. My apologies. Um, so we got really excited about this double blue bar pattern. And then we saw that it was shared across some inclusive samples, as well as a YDI sample and a latifolia sample. This was crazy, because this was one of the two gene versions that we wouldn't have expected to see within this. Um, you can see the samples I highlighted, which is a pretty broad group, surprisingly enough. Um, at the top, you can see the Cassilea uh, Kusikii, then you can see the Latifolia, then you can see the multiple samples of Subinclusa. <sighs> if you look closely at this tree also, you can see that, okay, these two simple samples of Kusikii that I have sampled, these are both from the same individual. These are just two different versions of chloroplasts that we were able to sequence from within that one. And if you look, they're very far, far apart in this phylogenetic tree that we had compiled. The reverse version is grouped with the other Kusikii, as would be expected. But the forward primer version, the Kusikii 129, is grouped in the clade with Subinclusa, Latifolia, and YDI. This points to the Kusikii individual in question having two different chloroplast versions, and importantly, we would have missed this if we had made a consensus sequence, which would have essentially been squishing them together and accounting for any differences between them by basically deciding that one was more ripe than the other. We only found this result when we considered the two primer reads separately. <sighs> so, our results. We found heteroplasmy in one of eight samples in one gene region. The version of the gene that we worked on was known to us, but had never been documented in the species Castilea kusikii. Interestingly enough, uh, the kusikii sample that we had was found in Idaho, but the Latifolia and Subinclusa samples that it had matched to were ones that had been collected in California. So we're looking at incredibly geographically disparate, which is just something that brings up a lot of questions. The big takeaways here, is that in basic biology, we learned that the chloroplast is uniparently inherited essentially across all of the plant kingdom. 
And we also learned that it's not recombining, so we expect that within a single individual there will only be one type of chloroplast. Additionally, we use these assumptions in our evolutionary analysis of Castilea. If this turns out to be true, which is to say that there might be some greater amount of heteroplasmy present across the entire gen genus of Castilea, then we're in for some really interesting ways that we might have to think about our analyses in the future. And then we also risk making erroneous inferences if we keep going on to the old way that we were thinking about it, if it turns out that this is different as we think. And like I said, this what we learned brings up a lot of new questions. We're wondering where is the heteroplasmy coming from? And due to the fact that Castile is parasitic, that brings up a whole new road of questions. It might be that hemiparasitic plants like Castilea may rely less on photosynthesis, so mutations in the chloroplast may be kept on for a longer period of time due to the fact that it's not relied on as heavily. <sighs> Which is to say that they'd be more receptive to mutations or variations. Um, and then there's also the concept of, unlike the uniparental uh, inheritances that we were working on as an assumption beforehand, there might be bi biparental chloroplast inheritance in some populations at least. And then this is like a little bit more of a theory that kind of grabbed my attention, uh, is that the heteroplasmy in the cell could be due to the absorption of the host plant's genetic material through the hostoria, which... That's wild, if that ends up being true. like It's possible. But in the future, we could go with this in a lot of different ways. Um, in the future, a truer test and a truer experiment could involve taking the original samples, the arachnoidea and the Beldingii that we had originally seen um, potential traces of heteroplasmy in. We didn't have those on hand, so we couldn't use them, but in the future, that would be nice to include. Um, and when we look back to the majority of Dr. Jacobs' Kusikii samples, there was no visible trace of heteroplasmy. And this could be due to heteroplasmy not being present within those individuals, or it could not have been detected, either due to low proportion of the alternate version chloroplast, or not being sampled enough times. So remember when I was talking about how uh, heteroplasmy can exist in different ratios within it? This kind of comes into effect because we only saw these when we were looking at, you know, a single extraction and looking at those two reads separately. So perhaps if we sample enough times, we could see heteroplasmy being present, present in really low ratios. And also due to the fact that we only sequenced each individual once, we could make a case for two or more different types of chloroplasts being present if we sample that one a set amount of times, like maybe five, throwing out a number. Um, I would like to acknowledge the National Science Foundation REU program for funding the SSI program. Um, I would like to thank my fellow interns in the 2021 SSI cohort. I would like to especially thank my lab mate, Cecilia Alvarado. It was your Kusiki I sample that started this whole thing, so <laughs> thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the California Academy of Sciences. I'd like to thank my mentor, Dr. Jacobs. I would like to thank the co-directors of the SSI program, Dr. Lauren Esposito and Dr. Rebecca Johnson. I would like to thank the Center for Comparative Genomics, particular, particularly Bonnie Cruz and Lynn Bonomo. You guys dragged me through this whole thing and I appreciate it. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to thank Mount Los Madonos College, where I currently attend, and I'd like to thank my friends and family. Um, questions? <laughs> questions? What, what, what was the most surprising aspect of this for you? For a long time, I didn't think we were going to find heteroplasmy, so even just in and of itself, finding that when we thought that would be a long shot or something that we'd have to do more long-term studies of to conclude on, um, just getting the result was pretty amazing. Um, 
Do you have any wild ideas on how to extend the geographic disparity? Okay, yeah, we actually went through this a little bit. Uh, so the question was, do we have any ideas of how I explain the geographic disparity between the Kusiki eye samples and the sub-inclusive samples? Um, it could be the alternate, the alternate chloroplast version could be the result of, you know, an ancestral type that was basically held onto throughout the migration, however long ago that was. Um, it could be that... It could be that the paternal pollen was able to just like travel sequentially that far and just was able to come down again tying into the ancestral concept but honestly who knows someone could have also just like taken seeds from one area and then just it's hard to grow from seed but it's possible so that could be a theory as well i'd love another question Haley. Okay, that's actually a really good question. I, which one was my favorite of it? Mm, I'm really fond of Kusiki eye, which is actually the one being shown right now. That's both the one that we found heteroplasmy in, and it's also just really interesting looking, given the fact that the Castilea that is usually talked about is usually the very red, very spiky looking ones. This one just looks very interesting. Is heteroplasmy common in other plant groups? And if so, what are the implications for this for like, you know, understanding phylogenies? If, is this going to mess up how we think about phylogenies if it turns out to be more common than we thought? That's a wonderful question. Um, so the question was, uh, is heteroplasmy present in other plant groups? And what are the implications if heteroplasmy does turn out to be um, more widely spread than is currently thought. And the interesting thing is that it would be really, really, the implications would be really widely spread and really mess up a lot of the ways that we try and uh, look at plant families the way that we try and look at phylogeny in plant groups if this turns out to be true. And currently, to my knowledge, heteroplasmy is not really known in many other plant groups. We know that it can be the result of mutations, but it's really not thought about as being like uh, a common thing in most organisms. Thank you. I just add on top of that, the more we look for it. The more we look for it, the more, the more we, we may find it. it. That's right. With all of the sequencing that we're doing these days, um, we are uncovering it a bit more. Mm -hmm. Kind of scary. Yeah, it's kind of scary. We <laughs> <laughs> had a question from Jack. I'm trying to question. Um, great talk, by the way. And Thank I'm you. I'm really fascinated by this. In, in animals, we'll sometimes get migration of a copy from um, mitochondria into the nucleus. Yes. Or, you know, among. And, and I'm just wondering. Is there any, does that ever happen in plants? And if it does, it, could, could that explain it? I mean, it looked like the versions are pretty divergent and, you know, appearing in other species. So I'm not sure that it could, but I just wonder if you thought about that. And it was something that we contemplated, and that is one of our theories as to why this might be a thing. But if, if this happens more commonly than we may think, which is what uh, Dr. Jacobs uh, work has been showing more and more, and what my project has shown, um, it would it would be really interesting to like look into that more as far as um, the potential for mitochondrial uh, migration into the cell. Yes. Dr. Esposito? So there's a, a question from Natalie Michael uh, who asks, what, what are the advantages of heteroplasmy? What are the advantages of heteroplasmy? Um, that's actually a really interesting concept because uh, I guess uh, in my offhanded idea, it could be just like the benefits of just genetic variation in general. Like, uh, <laughs> I don't know if my mentor would agree with me on this, but... <laughs> but <laughs> 
but my idea is that if it did help express traits or carry on traits that could be like uh expressed in the future um then just with in the fact that mutations are of benefit to organisms in general there could be the possibility that heteroplasmy could carry on those mutations longer term <laughs> Dr. Jacobs agrees with me, so I don't feel bad about saying it anymore. <laughs> Thank you so much. Awesome. Um, thanks so much, Gwen. Um, so we're going to stick with Castilea, and next we're going to hear from Cecilia Alvarado from the City College of San Francisco, and she'll be talking about morphometric analysis of Castilea affinis populations in along the San Francisco Peninsula coast. Come on up, Cecilia. Um, thanks everybody for coming and thanks everybody who has uh, logged into the live stream. Um, so, thank you. Um, strictly to learn about a species and a group of plants for like for knowledge sake. Um, so um, to kind of introduce Castilea, I know some of this might be a little bit redundant um, given that Gwen um, previously um, presented it to us. So um, Castilea is a genus of over 200 species within the family Orobanchisi, um, order Lamaceae, and of course within the kingdom Plantae. Um, California is home to 66 native species of Castilea, 11 of which can be found in the Bay Area's wild landscapes. Um, these plants are partially parasitic, as we learned previously, and um, they use specialized structures on their roots called Hastoria to latch onto the roots of a host plant. Um, another interesting fact about this genus is that it is still very young in evolutionary terms. So the telltale characteristics of many species um, within Castilea are still not well defined. Um, just like some people don't like being put into boxes, um, <laughs> this genus is notorious for not adhering to what we expect of it. Um, so according to the Jepson manual, Castilea is known for being highly variable within and between populations. Um, hybridization and polyploidy are common. And for those who need a reminder of what polyploidy is, um, it's when the cells of an organism have more than two paired homologous sets of chromosomes. So typically um, most organisms are diploid, so they're inheriting um, chromosomes from each parent. But with Castilea, there's a lot more there. Um, and so the last bullet point, um, consistent taxa are hard to define. So I want you all to remember that because we're going to circle back to that very soon. Um, so in the plant world, we use a dichotomous key to figure out what species we're looking at in the field or in the lab. Um, and with Castilea, we often get into the final steps of the dichotomous key, and it becomes increasingly difficult to clearly make correct versus incorrect decisions in order to arrive at an identification. Um, so in a practical sense, this, this can be really challenging when you're trying to identify a species. And one question that Dr. Sarah Jacobs is trying to answer is what does this mean biologically? 
what does it mean if a species is difficult to identify? Um, so organisms such as those in the Castilea genus are still very early in their speciation process and they still haven't really defined those morphological characteristics that make this identification process simple and straightforward. So essentially we can see how the evolutionary process is playing out in the here and now, not just having happened and then looking at it backwards. Um, so we, um, for my project, we settled on focusing on the species Castilea affinis in large part because it's local and accessible, but also because it's exemplary of this phenomenon of morphological variability. Um, my goal this summer was to help Dr. Jacobs set up a framework for consistently gathering morphological data in wild populations of Castilea so that the data can be compared with current taxonomy. Um, Dr. Jacobs did have some data already collected from one of her collaborators, so we were able to supplement our samples from the Bay Area. Um, and my role was to go out in the field and gather morphological data. So um, I used the INAT app to find where populations of Aphinus had been recently seen. Um, these sites were typically on popular hiking trails that got year-round foot traffic. Um, and so the most northern point of our range was um, in Drake's Estero in Point Reyes. Um, and then we covered the, all the way down to Pescadero. There was only five um, different sites, um, but we did cover a nearly 100 mile stretch of coastal bluffs in Chaparral. Um, and so the, the sites were Drake's Estero, Fort Funston in San Francisco, Maury Point Trail in Pacifica, um, a pullout just like on the side of Stage Road in San Gregorio, and the hillsides of Pescadero State Beach, just east of Highway 1. Um, yeah, all right. And then, um, so once I was out there and um, collecting the measurements, um, the data I collected were um, measurements of individuals that I found at each site using digital calipers. Um, the measurements were taken from both leaves and mature flowers, which were then dissected into their um, comprising structures. And um, those structures are the bracts, which is kind of the, the, the showy part of the flower that um, looks very leaf kind of, um, let's see if this is going to work for me. Uh, no. Um, so the structure that kind of has those little points kind of, um, yeah, lobed. Um, and then the calyx, which is um, on the far left on the bottom. Um, so that's kind of a tube that wraps around the corolla, which is kind of that boomerang shaped um, structure. Um, and so um, the measurements were also taken from the total length and width of the inflorescence, which is like the flowering part of the plant. Um, and then two to three samples were taken from each individual to try and capture what variation looks in a single individual. Um, and then multiple individuals at each population were measured so that we could assess population level variation. And then um, I also took tissue samples um, to collect for Dr. Jacobs to sequence at a future date. Um, and here are some of the examples of what I was seeing on the ground. Um, so we, what we see is potentially a single plant um, exhibiting very different morphological characteristics. Um, so the coral flower, the coral, coral colored inflorescence um, is more congested. It's more pom-pom shaped than the um, red inflorescence on the right which has um, longer flower structures and like much more vertical spacing in between each. Um, so if this is a single plant, um, this is an illustration of intra-individual variation in action. Um, so if you were an amateur botanist, wouldn't you find this confusing too? <laughs> um, and 
this is just one example, but I, I and Dr. Jacobs, while we were out there, we would see this everywhere. And there were multiple times where we just looked at each other and we, we said, this is freaking confusing. Um, and there were several times where I would come to her and I would say, I don't know what I'm seeing. I don't know if this is aphanous. And she was just like, yep. <laughs> um, so then that brings us to expectations versus reality. And this is one of those life lessons we're always learning. Um, so circling back to that point that I asked you to remember, um, that consistent taxa are hard to define. Um, what this means is, depending on the resource that you're using to define affinus, you can be led down different paths. So exam for example, here I have two traits that are um, used to uh, define affinus, the corolla length and the calyx length using the Jepson manual, which considers only California individuals. Um, and then we're also showing the Flora of North America guide, which considers affinus in, in, across its entire distribution. So from, um, from Baja California in the South, all the way up into Washington in the North. Um, so these graphs show the minimum, like the bottom red triangles, and then the maximum, which are the top red triangles. Um, and the black dots are the individuals, the individual measurements that I took. Um, and then the yellow triangles are, um, correspond to the minimum and maximum values of, um, of neglecta, which is a subspecies of affinus. Um, and so we can see that the dots are not falling neatly in between those red triangles. Um, sometimes they're way below, sometimes they're much more close to neglecta. And even just like if you compare the FNA and the Jepson, there's, there's, there are contradictions, there, they, they don't always overlap. Um, and so when those minimum and maximum values differ, um, depending on which source we're relying on to make our identification, we might consider or completely ignore affinus as a potential identification. And on top of that, when I take something consistently considered affinous and I plot it with these trait values, I see that oftentimes it's exceeding the measurements, the measurement traits I'm expecting. Um, so I'm using this figure to underscore that it's incredibly difficult to identify affinous. Um, the dichotomous keys sometimes conflict and some trait values overlap. And again, this is what Cassoulet is notorious for. So one of Dr. Jacob's goal is to better describe species boundaries using both molecular data and morphological data. Um, so here we did a multivariate morphological analysis to determine the morphological structure present in the species that we that we call affinus. Um, the question we're trying to address is: Is affinus a singular cohesive morphological cluster? And here are the results. And I I know this is kind of hard to see, so I'll walk you through some of the things to focus on. Um, First of all, we have three different clusters. Um, we're seeing three morphological clusters in our data set, and they correspond to the blue, red, and green points. Um, and the different shapes correspond to the different geographical locations that we sampled. Um, and we look at, when we look at the geographic location of the individuals that make these clusters, we see that those geographic locations do not exactly correspond to the clusters. For example, the, the blue individuals on the far upper left corner, um, like um, they're their own cluster. Um, and however, there, but, but there are some of them in the green cluster too. Um, and then similarly, we can see that the red cluster is composed of individuals from geographic locations that are also in the green cluster. And the take home message of this is that these morphological characteristics are not corresponding with geography. Um, they're widely scattered across geography. 
And um, because our analysis are considering all the traits at the same time, it's hard to know what, what, is, what these clusters are morphologically speaking. Um, so we could go to any of these sites and observe all of these morphological clusters at any given spot. And so again, this underscores just how challenging it was to definitively identify these as affinous. Um, and so here, um, we're doing a similar analysis, expanding the sampling to include other members of the species complex. So um, Latifolia, uh, Littoralis, Mendocinensis, Neglecta, and YDI. Um, and um, we're seeing if the resulting structure would correspond to currently defined species. So um, here I'm showing you the same type of clustering analysis with no a priori assignment of individuals to species. Um, and what we see is six clusters, and these do not correspond to the species that are currently recognized in taxonomy. Um, Aphinus itself, um, which are the square shapes, and I know for y'all back way in the back, it's probably a little hard to see, um, but it's it's kind of all over the place. It's it's there's some in red. Um, there's green, pink, and teal, and blue. Um, so when we put all of these complex members together, we get clusters that are composed of all the individual species. So this shows that our taxonomy is poor at reflecting the variation that we're seeing in nature. And this suggests that the species boundaries need more work. Um, so moving forward, um, to be able to define these species better, we need to, um, we need to be able to sample and measure aphanus across its entire range um, and continue the molecular data um, sequencing of tissue samples collected um, in situ. Um, and Dr. Jacobs will continue um, morphological data collection in her lab. Um, and then another takeaway from this is that attempting to use iNaturalist um, for finding, um, finding a species can be a lot more challenging than the taxonomy or iNaturalist would have us believe. Um, and while iNaturalist is a phenomenal tool, um, with species like these that are really easy to misidentify, um, using a picture is simply not enough to properly identify it. Um, and in many instances, I would go to locations where someone had reported an observation of uh, Aphinus, only to find that it wasn't Aphinus at all. Um, and um, I'm curious to know what role the algorithm plays in this, because if people are reporting Aphinus, more like more and more and more and more it's going to start suggesting affinus more and more and more and more and how is that going to shape um what the observation data looks like over time are we are people picking the first thing that pops up in the search bar as soon as they're um putting in castilea um or are there other algorithmic factors at play um, and, um, as far as what's next for me, I'll continue going to City College for this fall and planning to transfer to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. And, um, through this project, like I became so curious about the ecological role of Castilea and its relationships to its host plants and, and to pollinators. And so I have so many more questions and, um, at this point, I might just turn my backyard into a living laboratory for Castilea and other native plants and see what, what happens there. Um, why is it not working? 
Um, okay. Okay. So, um, like to thank uh, Dr. Jacobs um, for working with me on this project and and um, mentoring me and helping me with all of the data analysis and um, for really trusting me with this project and teaching me how to do field work. Um, and Lynn for being fantastic when I was learning in the lab and when I was panicking. Um, and thank you to Rebecca Johnson and Dr. S um, Dr. Rebe Rebecca Johnson and Dr. Lauren Esposito for um, facilitating this program. Um, thank you to my cohort of interns. Y'all have been fantastic and it's been such a pleasure to get to know all of you. Um, and thanks to my friends and family who have encouraged my love of nature, even when I'm covered in dirt and forget to text back. <laughs> Any questions? Yes, way in the back. So with your experience using Jepson and for North America for keying, mm -hmm. what advice would you have for someone trying to key Castileas on the coast in the Bay Area? Anything to come up with help? I mean, I, I like the idea of using the more regional uh, manual, um, being Jepson, since it's, um, talking more specifically about what occurs in this area. Um, obviously, when you're trying to look at an entire range, so outside of California, so um, the, the flora of North America might be more useful um, in terms of having um, just like a, a more, um, kind of just a, like a, a broader range um, if, if there are variabilities that are specific to the Bay Area. Yeah, anything else? Yeah, Gwen. Um, what advice do you have people for people who want to do uh, field research as someone who's uh, done a lot of that this summer? Um, Lots of tick spray. Um, and um, I guess the, one of the main things that I um, really struggled with was wanting to just hit the ground running really, really quickly and going out to every site and, and filling up my days um, just going out and doing field work. Um, the reality of how that plays out is obviously more complicated, um, given that some of these sites we had to hike for hours into, um, and also just, you know, all the factors of like being within the Bay Area. Sometimes you have to factor in traffic, you have to factor in being hungry. Um, and so um, I think for any sort of field work, um, making sure to um, just take everything you need and know that um, you have to be thorough. You have to like take it slow um, and really pace the, the data collection in a way that you're going to be able to stay on top of it, not like have it pile up at the last minute. Um, but um, yeah, I, you know, I kind of came into the program being open to anything. Um, and I specifically, when I was applying to the program, I really wanted something that had a field work component to it because that is so much of what I love doing. Um, like when I'm, you know, when I'm not doing research, um, just going out and hiking and looking at what's out there, looking at the plants, looking at the mushrooms, looking at the animals. Um, and so, if you're already someone who is really geared towards that, then just keep going out there. And iNaturalist is a great tool to keep doing that and kind of tracking your observations and then, you know, comparing with literature and with 
dichotomous keys to make sure that what you're spotting is really like accurate. Yes, uh, Arya. Yeah, great talk. Um, and uh, what are your thoughts on, on how, like, trying to define the species or these species that don't fit in the boxes? Like, how does that apply to other species beyond Tesla? Like, where you talking about? So, um, what are my thoughts on species definitions for? organisms that are also difficult to define in, in species terms. Um, I mean, again, like this project really kind of underscored how, you know, as humans, we really love to put things into neat little boxes. And when we can't, when something defies those expectations, it can be really frustrating. It can be a little maddening. It's it's kind of a good practice in um, just trying to not be biased by what you see and just taking the observations for what they are. And I mean, I I can't I don't know a whole lot about other species um, where this is happening. Um, but one of the things that I kind of am taking from this is like as this plant is still in its early evolutionary process, like what are we doing to shape that evolutionary process? And how are we, how are our activities and how we interact in the spaces that it exists shaping its, its future evolution? And I think, especially with um, a lot of these species that are currently defined, some of them are endangered, some of them are at risk. And um, when we look at conservation efforts, we really do need to take take into account that, sure, this might be one species that is endangered, but also like, what about all the other ones that, you know, don't fit neatly into that species um, category, but still need protection, still need conservation. Oh, more questions. <laughs> you did. Uh, yeah, I, I found your point about iNaturalist at the end to be interesting. You know, mm -hmm. One of the big problems we have with like social data in these algorithms is when you're trained on twice subsets of a population, mm -hmm. that can become worse because you've been forced right. by learning of its own classification to get back to what you trained out. Mm -hmm. so any ideas? I don't know how the iNat um, recognition algorithm works either. Any ideas on how you would address that? Maybe? I, you know, it's something that I've been thinking about in the last couple of weeks. I don't, I'm, you know, I don't have any background in like algorithms or software development or anything like that. I, I hardly even know how Instagram works. Um, <laughs> and so, um, you know, like it clearly, um, like, yeah, these are these are the questions we need to be asking, especially when we're we're embarking in citizen, citizen science projects, like. Um, and yeah, I, I would love to know from the developers, like what, what is going on algorithmically and how can it be improved for the way that users interact with the platform and how we can give feedback. Cause there, there is the ability to give feedback and I've been on iNaturalist, um, kind of giving feedback to people who are, are making these observations on organisms that don't quite look like Athenis. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I guess all we can really do is just um, experts need to be on those apps as well and saying, hey, this is not Athenis. This is probably Subinclusa. And, or like in my case, like I went there and I said, yeah, that's definitely Subinclusa. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, it just takes a lot more participation um, for amateurs and for experts to kind of keep that feedback loop going. Yes. One of the other things, questions that raises is not just the citizen science data, but basically that the traditional characters that have been used by professional botanists mm -hmm. may show far more variation and what are your thoughts on, on 
Um, are these just entities that can't be recognized um, morphologically, or are there other creatures that might prove to be useful um, uh, in separating taxa that, that mm -hmm. have not been traditionally well sure and and this is something that has come up in conversation with uh dr jacobs and i where um taxonomy is is evolving right like even um with the advent of like dna sequencing and and just how much more we're able to get um you know year after year and and, and quantify what the dna is telling us um i mean even just you know as an amateur mycologist like I, I've, I've seen in the last like 10 years, how much reclassification has happened. Um, and, you know, it's, I think, useful to think about taxonomy as a fluid system that is evolving um, to meet the needs of what we're seeing in nature versus trying to have what we're seeing in nature fit squarely in the taxa. Um, and so, um, in that sense, like, yeah, we're probably going to need to to tweak those taxonomical um, criteria um, over time. And especially with species like this or organisms like this that are still not in their very telltale morphological characteristic um, boxes, so to speak. Oh, more questions. Um, we have a, a whole of questions. Um, we need to move on. Um, <laughs> so you guys find Cecilia after the break to delve into questions about taxonomy and um, species continua. Um, all right, so we have one more um, talk this morning, and that will be from John Nguyen from Columbia University, and he will be talking about diversity and distribution of reed frogs on Bioko Island in Equatorial Guinea. All right, you're up, John. Hey, thank you, Rebecca, for the introduction. Hi everyone, I'm John, and today I'll be talking to you about a genus of frogs called Hyperolius from Bioko Island, Equatorial Guinea. But before I start, I'd like to thank these following people and institutions for supporting me throughout this project, and also the NSF for funding this program. I've been having the time of my life in San Francisco, and it's really all thanks to everyone in this room and also the people watching live stream, so thank you. So Bioko is an island located off the coast of Equatorial Guinea in Africa, and it's one of four islands in the Gulf of Guinea archipelago. It's actually the youngest island in the archipelago, but relative to its size and age, it has the highest level of di diversity, albeit low endemism. And this is because Bioko is a land-rich island. The other three islands are oceanic islands, so they're a bit further off the coast. And a land-rich island essentially means that there are cycles of rising and retreating sea levels. So that really encourages like dispersal and like movement of animals from the continent to the island and vice versa. Um, Bioko is located near the equator, so um, it has a really tropical environment and it ranges from lowland rainforest to montane rainforests. And on Bioko, you can find a genus of frogs called Hyperolius, and Hyperolius is situated within the Hyperolidae family, which is endemic to Africa and is one of the main groups of tree frogs. And Hyperolius is the most species rich genus in this family, so there's 152 species. You can see how it takes up a majority of this phylogeny here. Specifically on Bioko, you can find four species of Hyperolius. Um, two of them are confirmed, so that's H. oscillatus and H. tuberculatus, and two of them are unidentified. Um, that's H. C. F. Cuscaventris and H. C. F. Injami. C. F. basically means that there's a level of uncertainty with the correct species ID. So we'll start off with oscillatus, maybe. Or not. <laughs> okay, <let's stop. laughs> the sound? Page unresponsive. Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> Let me try again. Do it on here. Mm 
heard of you do before the links over there. Like where are the links that you inserted in your so is this just not advancing? Yeah, it's just not oh, okay. advancing. All right, everyone, give us just a second. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I don't really want to have to exit because it's all set up very perfectly. My favorite frog. <laughs> She's not pictured here. But <laughs> <laughs> She's not there. Uh, okay. Um, I don't know. I guess we have to like exit the page and then come back and see if we can set it up again. So this might take a second. Okay. Everybody, sorry. Oh, that's snap. Snap. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just see if it reloads. Okay. Okay, thanks for bearing with us, everybody. I think I'll just be able to, it's gonna take a while to load. This is a really big slideshow because we have everyone's talks all together. So, right. really? <laughs> Initiation. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm okay, but. Um, so you can see everyone's beautiful slideshows from earlier and then we will page down. Oh, well, actually you can't see these thankfully because Laurel has made it so the Streaming audience doesn't have to see this. They can just see us. It's like a hundred and two or something. <laughs> if I could see it better, I would put it on the grid, you know, but like I don't I can't see it. <laughs> so. Well, I have to look at the slides. Someone else tell a story. John, tell us a story. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> I was not prepared for a story. Yeah, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, it was? Awesome. Thank you, guys. But that's the start. Where's the rest? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I was like, but wait, there should be more slides after that, right? Like. Oh. <laughs> All right, so um, what I'm thinking what I should do is probably stop it and just separate John's show and just show, show John's, but doing that like live on the live stream is probably not a fabulous idea. Um, so there are two options. Like we can stop for a second, well, so I can do that, or we can have John finish at two and be the kickoff for the next session because we're into like 12 20 or something so john are you okay with that that means you have to start again um yeah okay <laughs> you're okay with that <laughs> okay so thanks everyone on the live stream what we're going to do is we're going to reset up the show so john's is first or possibly separate because his has some awesome frog sounds and i think that's what's causing a little bit of this problem um so we'll make it separate and then we'll start again at two o'clock so Come back at two o'clock for the live stream. I wanna thank everyone who presented this morning. You guys did a fabulous job. Um, so let's do a little live call. And thanks to the mentors of the amazing students this morning. And we will look forward to seeing you all back here at two Pacific time. All right, thanks so much.